Alexis de Tocqueville grew up in a generation that was obsessed with poetry. Poetry was the, the mother science, the mother art. Poetry was the thing to which everyone oriented himself. And his generation wondered what should its themes be, how to write it according to what role, uh, what rules. And you'll notice that in his great masterpiece, Democracy in America, uh, unlike all of his other books, Tocqueville wrote in a style that is shaped visibly by poetry. The laws of prosody and meter govern the, 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 the shape of the sentences, the shape of the chapters, the mini chapters. They govern finally the shape of, the, of his book as a whole, which follows a sonata form and, in, in complicated ways. And the rhythmic qualities of his book, which as I say, uh, differs from everything else he wrote. The rhythmic qualities of his book generate, allow him to generate a special emotion from time to time. And the, the rhythmic or poetic qualities allow him to strike certain sentences that have a very strange power that seem to leap up from the page. And everyone who, who reads Tocqueville notices this. Every couple of pages you read a sentence which seems so remarkable for what it observes, but also for how it's said that you hit the table and you say, that's amazing. Some of those sentences are, uh, uh, are, uh, are, are aphoristic. He utters a truth. And others of them, which are the strangest of all, are prophetic. He seems to prophesize something that will happen hundreds of years ago. And of all the prophetic passages that have struck people's imagination for the now 180 years or so, uh, almost 200 years since, since the, the book came out, uh, I think the most striking, the most memorable, the one that has aroused perhaps the most commentary, uh, appears on the last page of volume one. The, the book, Democracy in America, is two volumes. Volume one came out in 1835. The last page is the single most dramatic place in the entire work. And on that last page, uh, he veers into a topic which, which he has not addressed at all, which he has not prepared you to pay attention to, a, a topic that catches you utterly uh, by surprise. Uh, the entire book until then has been about America and the Americans. He hasn't talked very much about other countries. Uh, there are a few comparisons to England, but most other countries go unmentioned. Uh, and so it's, it's about America and Americans, and suddenly he says, uh, uh, on the last page, uh, there are today on the earth two great peoples, two, who, uh, coming from different points, seem to be advancing toward the same goal. These are the Russians and the Anglo-Americans, as to say the English-speaking Americans. And then he goes on to compare these two peoples. And he says, uh, the, the Americans are, are struggling with nature to build things, and the Russians are advancing with the sword. And he says, to attain uh, his goal, uh, the first, uh, meaning uh, 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 the, the American, uh, relies on personal interest or private interest and, and allows it to act uh, without uh, being directed. All the strength of his of his reason, uh, and, and the second, the Russian, concentrates all the power in a single person. The first, the American, has for its principal mode of action, liberty. The second, servitude. Their point of departure is different. Their ways uh, are diverse. Nevertheless, each of these people uh, seems to be called by a secret design of providence to hold in his hands one day the destiny of half the world. So it's a very strange passage. Now, uh, uh, why did he write this? And I'll, I, I'm going to address this question. 
But allow me first to say that there is no possible, there's no place on earth more dramatic and no place in all the history that has taken place since Tocqueville wrote this book more dramatic uh, uh, for asking this question than this university hall in Kiev in 2014. Uh, Kiev, the capital of a revolutionary Ukraine that is under attack by Russians. Tocqueville wrote Democracy in America uh, because he himself underwent the experience of a revolution. And this was the revolution of 1830 in Paris. Tocqueville was 25. He had just uh, completed his law studies. So he was essentially a student. You will remember the French Revolution broke out in 1789 and was very quickly a failure. It, it descended into the reign of terror. It, 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 it conjured up a civil war within, within France. It led to the military dictatorship of Napoleon who launched a, a mad war across the whole of, of Europe causing a vast amount of death and destruction uh, to many places including his own country, a calamity. And at the end of this calamity in 1814, the, the, the royal family, the Bourbons, the family of Louis XVI, who had been guillotined, came back to power. Louis XVI's younger brother became king. Uh, he died, then his brother uh, became king. So the Bourbon family was, was back in power. And they tried to be uh, decent in some ways. They ruled uh, with a charter, you know, an aspect of constitutional rule. Uh, so they were more limited in their power than the Bourbon family had been previously. But still, it was the old monarchy. It was the old system. And uh, nonetheless, ideas within society had advanced somewhat. There was a general appreciation that there ought to be at least freedom of the press at, in some limited degree. And in 1830, uh, Louis XVI's younger brother, who was now king, Charles X, uh, issued a, a decree limiting the freedom of the press. And immediately, crowds came out in the streets, above all, the students. This was, became now the first revolution in history led by students. And with the students came many other people, and a revolution took place. It took three days to overthrow Charles X. Uh, the revolution was resolved by the National Assembly who picked a new king, but who wasn't really a legitimate king because a king can't properly be picked. He should just inherit his, his throne. So the new system was kind of a cross between monarchy and, uh, and, and, and uh, republicanism. Still, this was a real revolution. And this was Tocqueville's experience of it. And it had a strange quality, or a number of strange qualities. The first was that it was the first time in history when you could see the phenomena, this very strange phenomena of simultaneous revolutions breaking out in various places around the world, or in this, in this case, in various places around Europe. Nothing like this had happened before, but now, with the revolution of 1830 in Paris, there's also a revolution in Belgium and another revolution in Switzerland. And as some of you may know, a revolution in the, the November uprising in Poland. And all of these things took place within a few months, which is virtually simultaneous from the, from the perspective of 1830. Why did they take place simultaneously? You know, for mysterious reasons, but I'll note one reason. Uh, that is not so mysterious. For the first time you had a technology of mass uh, instant or rapid communication, which consisted of two inventions. A, a printing press that could, that could print daily newspapers cheaply so that the masses of people could buy the daily newspaper, and the telegraph. So between the telegraph and the daily newspaper, the cheap daily newspaper, you could have an excitement that spread from one capital to others uh, uh, around the world. Now, let me explain that when you find yourself in a revolution of that sort, the emotion that presses upon you is very strange and very intense because you are aware that you are participating in an event. This is the experience of Tocqueville's 
generation. You're aware that you're, you're experiencing a vast event. You're aware that forces larger than you can imagine have come into play. You're, you're, you're aware or faintly aware that it has international uh, uh, connotations. So you get the impression that the destiny of mankind is in play. You get this impression very strongly. You get the impression that enormous changes are at hand. Uh, you certainly get the impression that enormous changes are at hand in regard to your own life, that your own life is going to be turned upside down. And so you find yourself riding as, as if upon an ocean wave of these events and, and impressions. Then you, you, you find yourself, or typically you, you find yourself in one other very uh, difficult situation, which is you're, fi you're in the middle of this revolution, you're taking part in it, or you're standing on the sidelines and observing it, and, and you discover, you're trying to make up your mind, and you discover that you're in an intense crisis with your own family, with your own background, that, that, that your mother and father think one thing, you think another thing, the family direction is this way, you want to go that way, or you wonder whether you want to go that way, and you have a personal crisis. And this is absolutely uh, uh, the rule. Now, of everybody who has gone through uh, such an event and has undergone a, a personal crisis, I think that Alexis de Tocqueville was the, the person who, at age 25, went through all this, was the person who dealt with this crisis most creatively. His crisis was extreme, and, and that was because his own family were ancient French aristocrats, and the family was tied uh, to the Bourbon monarchy that had just been overthrown. They were tied to the Bourbon monarchy by belief, by political belief. They were tied by custom. And they were tied by religious reasons. This was their interpretation of Catholicism. It was, that was proper to be loyal to the legitimate king. Uh, and they were tied also because during the revolution of 1789, before Alexis's birth, Alexis was born in 1805, but during the revolution of 1789, his parents and the, and the larger family were loyal to Louis XVI, who was guillotined. And then, during the reign of terror, Tocqueville's father and his mother were imprisoned. And other members of the family, the, the cousins, were guillotined. The family of Tocqueville's mother uh, were guillotined, and, and Tocqueville's father and mother uh, themselves were just waiting for themselves to be guillotined. Then Robespierre was overthrown. The reign of terror came to an end, and they <laughs> exited the prison. Tocqueville's father was famous for having had his hair turn white, although he was a very young man. So Tocqueville now, Young Tocqueville, Alexis de Tocqueville, in 1830, he looks at the overthrow of the Bourbon monarchy, and from the point of view of his own family, of course, he has to be horrified. And, uh, and now he has, uh, yet he himself is wondering, and now he has another problem, because he has just gotten his law degree, and he's ready to practice law as a magistrate. But in order to practice law, he must swear an oath to the new king. He cannot swear an oath. It would be a, a, a dreadful dishonor to his family to swear an oath to this usurper who's just overthrown the, the, the Bourbon monarchy. And at the same time, he has to worry, maybe this new revolution is going to bring a new reign of terror. No one knows. It didn't, but he had to worry about it. So he dealt with this problem uh, by joining together with his best friend, uh, Gustave de Beaumont, from another aristocratic family. And the two of them went to America for nine months in 1831 and two. And they went to America in order to ask two questions, or, or Tocqueville especially, two questions. One, if there's a democratic revolution, could it possibly be good? There was no experience of a good revolution in France. There'd been bad revolutions. But could there be a good one? Had there been a good one in America? 
And the second question was, if you're going to make the transition from a, a, a hierarchical society to a democratic society, how do you do it? So he came and he asked these, these questions. Now he had two responses. The first, to, to his, his experience, the first was to come to America and, and feel that he had seen, that in America he had seen what he'd begun to see in France in 1830, in the revolution. That he'd begun to see something that had the power of absolute destiny. That he knew for a certainty that all of history was moving from a hierarchical society to a democratic society. He knew this because he saw it, and also he looked back at, at, at 700 years of history, and he looked at the progression of the Middle Ages, and he found himself thinking that yes, he could see something so vast and, and, and so powerful that he was convinced that he saw the finger of God tracing a, a path across the, the stars. And this path was leading to democracy. By democracy, he meant something very specific. He calls it equality of conditions. And, and what it really means, it, it does not mean equality of, of wealth or material goods. It means equality of, of rank. A democracy is, is a society in which there is no special class of nobles, nor is there some special ethnic group, nor, nor some special group of any sort who possess and rights and privileges that other people do not possess. So a, a, a democracy is a society thus that has a, an equality of status. Now, it, in order to have an equality of status, uh, uh, the, the laws and customs have to create that situation, but the really telling thing, the, the factor that, that identifies for Tocqueville a society as democratic is psychological, a uh, democratic society is one in which people feel that they have the same standing as everyone else. It, whether or not they're as rich, they feel that they are the equal of the next person. He felt that he'd seen such a society. Now, of course, he confined his travels pretty much to the northern part of America and uh, uh, the United States at the time uh, only went halfway across the continent and he remained in the north, so we're talking about, if you can picture the United States as a, as a, as a rectangle, we're, we're talking about uh, one quadrant of it. So New England, uh, uh, the Middle Atlantic states, Ohio, uh, places like that, where there wasn't slavery. And, and this was the part of America that he was uh, talking about. So he felt that all of history was leading in the direction of such a society. And by all of history, he meant his own country too, France, and uh, more largely, uh, more broadly, uh, Europe, with some implication of the rest of the world. So that was his first feeling. And he describes it as a religious experience. He says he experienced a religious terror, meaning he trembled at the, at the thought of this. And he felt that if God had traced his finger across the sky, if that was the meaning of it, uh, then to oppose this development toward democracy is to oppose God. So he'd already made a, you know, a tremendous decision in regard to his own family. Now he wants to address his family. So he asks uh, uh, himself, uh, it's an open debate that he has with himself. He asks himself, okay, we're going in the direction of democracy. Is it good or is it bad? It might be good or it might be get bad. And he, for the next 800 pages, he debates this with himself. Uh, and it's a real debate because he goes through moods and his, his mood is sometimes this way and sometimes uh, more discouraged. In general, on balance, more often, he thinks, yes, it is good. And it's good because a, demo a real democratic society 
is one that develops the kind of people, the kind of citizens who are able to participate, who are able to, to, to populate a democratic society, are able to make it work, who have the, the sense of virtue and the sense of the willingness to participate, who are good citizens, who know what it is to be good citizens, who want to be good citizens and are. And, and a democratic society, according to him, has this kind of population because it itself, the, the society generates people like this. And it generates people like this uh, above all uh, because, or first of all, because of the kinds of institutions that it, it develops. And, and he goes through uh, what are the institutions that lead to this. Uh, the first is, is political decentralization. And political decentralization means that people locally can participate in the government in some way. So the government is not designed to be top down or from the center out. That, so there's a, a political de decentralization. Then a whole series of other institutions. The most fantastic chapter in the book is on local self-government. He describes something called uh, 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 town meetings. Uh, uh, a town meeting is something that takes place in a small town where the entire town will assemble uh, now and then and have a meeting so to, to, to discuss things, to make decisions, which is to say it is a direct democracy, not a representative democracy. Now this kind of direct democracy that he describes in an absolutely ecstatic chapter, almost with a, a utopian mood, uh, uh, sound, if you've read some Proudhon or Bakunin, it, it can sound like the anarchists uh, speaking about self-government or, uh, you know, it, it, it has some quality that the Machiavisti had, uh, it, it, if, you, if you picture them. Uh, but Tocqueville's version or the version that he describes is superior to either of those kinds of, of di direct democracies because it is linked also to rule of law and linked also to representative democracy. So, he's, so, so the American system, as he describes it, is able to incorporate direct democracy into representative democracy. He describes the jury system in which the ordinary person participates in judicial decisions of guilt or innocence in trials. He describes uh, uh, yet another uh, aspect of, of participation, which is has nothing to do with the state and nothing to do with legal systems, which is voluntary associations. So people join together because they are in favor of some reform or other, or they're in favor of something. And instead of petitioning the government to, to, uh, 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 to administer this, this reform, they may go out and just do it themselves. Thus, if they want to build a building for some purpose, instead of asking the government to build it, they go out and build it themselves, form an association. He laughs at one of them, and, and, and it's, it's, it's interesting to see. He sees uh, a, uh, what is called a temperance movement, uh, marching by in a mass march. A temperance movement is a movement that wants to ban alcoholism and, and wants to get people to stop drinking. And he reflects that in France, if there's a problem with too much drinking, people will petition the government, meaning the central government in Paris, to come close the bars. And they'll wait for the government to do it or not. But in America, the people just go out and march in the streets, demanding it of their fellow citizens. They're not demanding it of the government. They're, they're, they're just demanding it as a social reform. And he found himself laughing. What a ridiculous movement, uh, he, he thought. And then he had a second thought. He thought, no, actually, it's very impressive. It's moving. Here was uh, uh, something, excessive drinking, that required a reform. And, and the people just took it into their own hands uh, to, to create a reform movement, which is not the state. They just did it themselves. It's a, a movement from the bottom up instead of from the top down. So these are... Uh, uh, what he describes as, as voluntary associations. And then these kinds of, of, of organizations, these kinds of, of, 
institutions, the voluntary associations, the juries, the town meetings, uh, uh, all have the effect of, have, have, a, have a double or triple effect. They allow people to participate, but they also train people to participate. So by participating in these things, you learn how to participate. You learn how the government works. You are the government. Or you learn how social reforms are made. You are making them. And, and, and by participating in a jury, you learn what is the law? What is the meaning of the law? So that the, the, the nature of government is demystified. And, and these kinds of institutions have then an educational quality. He reflects that in some ways they lead to less efficient administration than the kind of government he knows in Europe, uh, where in, in, in France there's a very efficient administrative system, uh, but, uh, and more efficient than what he sees in America, but it leaves the citizens in France stupid, not knowing how to do things themselves. And, and leaves them in, 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 in a frame of mind that he describes as servile. They're waiting for somebody else to do it for them. Whereas the participants in these kinds of institutions uh, uh, in the America that he's describing are themselves doing it, know how to do it, have become intelligent about doing it. So these kinds of institutions then create better people. Then he goes on. He sees uh, a new spirit of business or commerce in America, where he sees people and he admires them uh, being rash in business and, and boldly going out and doing something really new. He marvels at how uh, uh, American uh, shipping is, is beginning to conquer the world uh, in a commercial sense. And why is it? Because they're so bold. Uh, and he, he finally realizes that there's a grandeur to this, which is a great uh, leap for an aristocrat like himself, because aristocrats are not supposed to work, you know, and, and, and certainly not supposed to admire business, but he, but he sees a grandeur in it. And he thinks that America, the democracy in America that he, he's seen has invented a grandeur of a new kind. France had a grandeur, but it consisted of Napoleon's army, which wreaked nothing but destruction. And America, America has a grandeur which consists of businesses that, like Napoleon, are conquering the world, but, but doing it constructively. And uh, so he, he, he admires that. He sees a new kind of family life that, that results from all of this. Because if you've eliminated the, uh, uh, different conditions, uh, if you've eliminated rank, then you find family lives in, in which it's no longer the case that, that the older brother is, has more prestige than the younger brother because in the, old, in the old system, the older brother is going to inherit the title, he's going to inherit the, 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 the land, all the prestige is going to be his. So he's at one level, the younger brother is at another level, the father holds himself above uh, uh, distantly and is cold. Whereas in the democratic family that Tocqueville describes, Everybody is sort of equal. The brothers are equal. They're going to share the inheritance, so one is not, not higher than the other. And the father becomes a friend to his sons. And uh, he has some odd comments about women and how they're very virtuous because they don't leave the home. But um, so, you know, so some aspects of his book uh, are, are, are peculiar. But the, but the notes on family life are very striking. And finally, he turns to religion. And he notices something new in American democracy here, too, which is that in France, the assumption had been all along that religion must be the enemy of progress and of democracy. But in America, he notices that their churches are the friend of progress and democracy. And then he notices that democracy is the friend of the church, that the churches prosper, whereas they wither in France. And he notices something else, that under democracy, a man begins to conceive of God more grandly because the individual is no longer confined to his one little tiny place in life. He, the, society is open to him. And if society is open to him, then he can conceive of a larger God. So he has a grander God. 
And by conceiving of God more grandly, he conceives of himself more grandly. It, it's it's a, a, a moving idea. Uh, then again, as I say, he is arguing with himself. So he tallies up all the things that see, seem to him horrendous and dangerous. He sees that democracy might lead to a different kind of tyranny, the tyranny of the majority. He notes antidotes to this, which be law and lawyers, but still a real danger of the tyranny of the majority, a kind of mob rule by the majority. He notices a tendency toward conformism of thought. He's horrified by this. He finds one person after another uttering the same opinions in, in, in America, a horrible uh, conformity. Uh, he notices a tendency toward cultural mediocrity. There's a leveling. And, and, and he worries about that. And he worries, finally, about something that he calls individualism, by which he means something bad. Uh, maybe we would say, uh, I don't know, egoism, selfishness. And, and, and uh, by, by individualism or selfishness, he means that under a democracy, it, where, where people no longer feel themselves to be part of some special class, and are no longer uh, given a, a particular role in, in life, they're likely, the individual is likely to begin uh, to think only of himself and not to care about society and to withdraw uh, from society and just look out only for himself. So these are all frightening. And then he sees a possible ultimate result of this, which is, if you are an individualist in this sense, and you've withdrawn from your sense of society, you're no longer going to be willing to sacrifice for society. And then he wonders, a democracy, would it be willing to fight? He observes that the United States, we're now in 1830, 31, that the United States following its war of independence with Britain has never been challenged. So there's no way to know whether a democracy would fight. And he begins to think about the possibilities. Now his imagination turns towards the race situation in America, the South, where there's African slavery. He's, he's very intelligent on, uh, about this, and he interprets the, the blacks and the whites. And, but he, he also can't picture, cannot picture a solution to this problem. And he imagines that there, there will end up being a race war or some kind of war will break out over slavery. And indeed, 30 years later, a war broke out over slavery, the American Civil War. But he's picturing this in the 1830s. He knows a war is going to, he feels that a war is going to break out over this. And then he imagines to himself that when a war like this breaks out, the United States will collapse. That the United States will not be able to summon the strength to fight to preserve its own unity. And then no one is going to be able to summon the power to impose a solution to this terrible problem. And he sinks into gloom. So he's gone back and forth. And now he's at the end of volume one. And his gloom deepens. And obviously, he runs his eye across the horizon of the entire world and he pictures democracy. And he says, is democracy going to triumph? And then his eye runs in this direction, and he sees Russia. And he thinks, this is what's happening. That in the future, there is going to be a gigantic conflict of the American principle of liberty and self-government and, uh, and, 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 and productivity, and, and what he describes as the Russian principle of the sword and one-man rule and servility and the book is over. So he leaves you wondering, what's going to happen? <laughs> he doesn't know what's going to happen. Now, uh, as I say, on balance, you can see where his feelings are. He's wild with enthusiasm for the democracy that he's seen in America. But his dark moods sometimes overcome him, and he, can't, he cannot quite decide He's conducting this debate honestly with himself, but it's obvious that he's also conducting the, de de the debate for the benefit of his family and his social circle. He wants, 
He wants to give the aristocrats, the champions of aristocrat, aristocracy or, or monarchism, uh, every possible argument and rebut it if he can. And some of them he can't. And above all, he can't rebut this, this question of whether a democracy will be able uh, to fight. Now, this passage about America and, and, and Russia uh, is, as I say, I think, above all, a reflection of his own uh, mood. It's, it's, it's his inner psychology. Uh, but it also does have a prof prophetic quality. And to see the prophetic quality, you do not have to move very far forward from the 1830s. Because in 1848, another of these simultaneous revolutionary waves broke out in Paris first and then all over Europe and even in uh, other parts of the world in, in some degree. And in Eastern Europe, you, or the Central and Eastern Europe, you had the question of a Russian or a czarist intervention. And the whole question of whether America should have something to do with this arose then. And it was because in the, Amer the American presidential elections are held every four years. So the 1848 revolution took place and then it failed everywhere. So the next American revolution was 18, uh, American election was 1852. So in the American presidential election of 1852, the revolutions of Europe in 1848 were debated and were an issue. And one of the figures, European revolutionary figures, uh, was Louis Kossuth, who was the leader of the Hungarian Revolution of 1848. Kossuth was campaigning for the Democratic Party in, 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 in the United States. And there were figures in the Democratic Party who were calling for the United States to send weapons to Kossuth in Hungary to, put a, uh, to fight a war against the Tsar. Uh, arisen. Of course, that idea was mad and, and uh, nothing was done with it. Uh, but it was already uh, there. Um, one other event about uh, 1848, which is that uh, Tocqueville, of course, was observing the revolution of 1848. And in, in Paris, the revolution went well for a little while. And uh, he took the occasion to issue a new edition of Democracy in America, in which he published a preface, which you can uh, which is difficult to find. Most editions of Democracy in America do not include the 1848 preface. Uh, the fantastic uh, French edition, the best French edition, does not include it. Uh, but there's a paperback French edition that does include it. And uh, I don't know what's available in uh, Ukrainian. Uh, but the 1848 preface is very interesting. It's obvious that Tocqueville is now it's as if he's clarified his relations with his family. You know, he's no longer upset about whether his father and mother would think, I don't know if they were still alive, um, uh, probably not. And uh, he, he, he's his own man. He's more confident in himself and he's very excited. And, and he wants to say, ah, so the new revolution has, has come out. And it's as if he holds up his book and he says, I was right. Meaning democracy is coming. It's inevitable, it is the finger of God, and it can be good. Uh, this is what I see when I look at Tocqueville in Kiev in, uh, in 2014. I, I, as I say, it, it's impossible to find a more dramatic place to read Tocqueville uh, than right here or to uh, talk about him. Because the revolution in Maiden, uh, uh, this revolution, which is your revolution, is absolutely a classic European revolution of the type that began really not in 1789, but in 1830. And uh, the revolution in Mayan is, is a direct descendant of, of uh, the 1830s in, in France, even in its style. Uh, the 1830 revolution uh, had many qualities, the students, uh, but there was, there was a, a little aftershock of it, which, which took place in 1832. A, a, a failed a, a additional revolution, which is the revolution you can read about in Victor Hugo's novel, Les Miserables. And that revolution is the first time in history you see barricades going up in the streets of Paris. 
And this is before photographs, no photographs of, you can see photographs of the barricades of 1848, but not of 1832. But there they are. And of course, uh, the other day as I'm wandering around at the square and I'm looking at the piles of tires and bricks, and, and, and I'm realizing this is it. This is the absolute classic statement. And it's, it's not that the barricades uh, are, are, from a military point of view, to put it that way, so, so effective. Uh, but they are a statement, they are expressive. And, and, and they're just one more indication of the classic nature of what has uh, uh, been happening here. Uh, so uh, I, I, I conclude by, uh, by, uh, with this one thought. You know, many statues of Lenin have come down. And I would suppose that there must be many pedestals that are now empty or uh, uh, parks, uh, 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 plazas uh, with a place for a statue that no longer has a statue. And I, I make a, a modest suggestion to you that one of those empty pedestals should be filled with the statue of Alexis de Tocqueville uh, because he speaks to the American situation, the American problem, and he speaks to your problem. And which is how to make the transition to a democratic society and how to make sure that, uh, uh, that the transition goes well and how to make sure that the revolutionary result is a good result and not a bad result, given that either is possible. So, thank you. Uh, yes, this is a very good question. It, it, it has been put to me and to us by uh, Leon Wieseltier, who's who's one of the principal organizers of the, of the uh, uh, general meeting. Um, so I'm, I'm glad for this, this question. He does speak about uh, American identity. Some of what he says about it uh, is confined to a, a kind of ethnic generalization about uh, uh, really the English, what happens to the English when they, when they emigrate across the Atlantic Ocean and become Americans. Uh, uh, he seems to prefer the Americans to the English, uh, uh, but um, it, it's a kind of ethnic uh, generalization. But he also makes a larger theoretical point, which is that the American, and I should have said this, uh, the, the, the American institutions that I've described, uh, the, the self-government that, that, that is permitted by uh, decentralization, the uh, businesses that arise, and perhaps above all, the new sense of religion that arises and the new way of conceiving God more grandly than, than before. All of this, in his mind, creates a identifiable culture or personality, which is that of the American. And so he does see a national identity in it. Uh, in some other writings of his, he compares uh, national identities uh, in a very amusing way because he, uh, in one of his uh, early essays about his trip to America, he describes traveling through the American Northwest uh, in a region bordering on Canada. Now you'll remember that Canada was originally settled by the French, later it was conquered by the English, but uh, the, the population of Canada in this period, the 1830s, is largely French. And he notices that the French, uh, the French Canadians, had not created a democratic society. That, that so it's, you don't get a democratic society just by moving across the ocean. Uh, they, they have not done it. They're, they're, they're living according to the old traditions. And he notices that what has resulted from this, which is that, that uh, the, the French are afraid of moving away from one another. They live much more, uh, much more closely uh, uh, condensed, so uh, a land value is much higher. It's the, they pay a lot more for land because they're living all, all together. And they're, from a business point of view, inert. They're not adventurous. They're not rash and brave in their business uh, efforts. The Americans, the, the Anglo-Americans, the English-speaking Americans are venturing into the, into the wilderness to, uh, uh, to make new farms, and the French Canadians are not. And, and, it, and so he sees a definite, this is the, uh, I think the largest, uh, uh, one of several uh, national 
comparisons that he makes to show that yes, you can end up with national traits and, and the American trait that he sees is, 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 is dynamic, but, but it is a trait. And the French Canadian trait that he sees is, is inert. Uh, and it is, it is a trait. And these traits follow from or are in accord with the institutions that the, that the several peoples have constructed. I, I guess what I'm asking you is that he has these types of traits. Oh, sorry. He has these natural characteristics and types of traits, but he doesn't have nationalism mm -hmm. yet, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, there, no. there isn't American nationalism of the, in the sense that or any nationalism. Because he was writing before it, I guess. He's not writing before it, but, but so the question, is there an American nationalism? So I, uh, I'm asking, what is nationalism? He notices that there is certainly an American uh, pride, which he laughs at, uh, because uh, he notices that if you criticize America to an American, you'll, you'll, you'll have hell to pay. And, 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 and uh, so he, he laughs at that uh, very easily, and he shrugs it off. Uh, and uh, so there's, a, there, there's an American pride, but, but there isn't really a sense of uh, America as a, as, a, as, a, as a national group in conflict with, let us say, the Europeans. Uh, no. Uh, and, and the America uh, that he's describing is open to people from uh, with, if you leave aside uh, uh, the situation of uh, black slavery, which is one exceptional situation, and then there's the question of the American Indians, which is another exceptional s situation. But if, if, if you're speaking about uh, uh, people with a, uh, the kind of education and cultural background that, that people have in Europe, that the United States that Tocqueville is describing is open to them all. And, and is uh, uh, welcoming and friendly uh, to them all. So he discovers, uh, for instance, that uh, uh, America as a whole is Protestant, but there's a place for the Catholics, who are sometimes French and uh, uh, sometimes Irish, largely Irish, and he, he, he commends the role being played uh, within the United States by the Irish and French Catholics. Uh, similarly, he sees that in America, there is a uh, tendency to be able to sympathize with other peoples around the world uh, who may be uh, oppressed. So uh, he finds himself attending, in 1831, a solidarity meeting somewhere out west, uh, uh, in the American West, um, <coughs> by Americans for the oppressed of Poland, because the Poles have lost the uprising of the November uprising of, of, of 1830. So he sees this kind of openness. Uh, but of course, uh, there is, there is a, a black slavery, which is, which is grotesque. And then there's the tragic condition of, uh, of, of the American Indians. So uh, America has its dreadful flaws. But, but in principle, the democratic quality is, is not a nationalist one. It's, it's, it's not a, a destiny of some ethnic group or national group, the, the Americans. It's open to everybody. The, uh, the question is well put. Uh, this is a period when uh, uh, the American Indians uh, still dominate a large part of the continent. And uh, the, the European, what he calls the European po population, the Anglo-Americans, begin on the East Coast, the Atlantic Coast, and are moving progressively westward. And as they do, they come into conflict with the Indians. And uh, he writes about this uh, really brilliantly and movingly. He weeps for the Indians. And he describes seeing the Indians, a group of Indians uh, crossing the Mississippi as they're fleeing the whites. And, and uh, his, and his description of this is just heartbreaking because the, the Indians are crossing the, the, the river on, on uh, rafts and they've left their dogs behind. And when the dogs realize they've been abandoned, the dogs start to bark. 
So the, the Indians are crossing the, the, the river, the dogs are barking, abandoned, and, and it's just to weep. And uh, so he, he, he understands uh, the full tragedy of it. But he also understands uh, the extreme difficulty of, of, of coping with it. Uh, he does, because he explains, first of all, why the Indians are fleeing. The Indians are fleeing not necessarily because they've been persecuted. The Indians flee because as, as the, the, the European farmers advance westward, when they create a farm, if they, they carve out a piece of the, of the wilderness and build a farm, it means that, the, that the, the animals, the wild animals, flee because they can't survive on a farm. They need their full wilderness. So the animals are fleeing ahead of the, of the pioneer farmers. And as the animals flee, the Indians, who are hunters, must follow the animals. And so the only solution for the Indians is uh, to give up hunting and become farmers. And then he explains that uh, white society, uh, in general, would accept the Indians as farmers. The Indians are invited to join white society and be farmers. But they have no educational background in farming. They don't know how to farm. They're hunters. They have no skills at farming so that they can become farmers. But if they become farmers, they immediately become the lowest, poorest, most miserable farmers. So they are invited to join white society, but, but in the nature of things, they're invited to join it only at the very bottom. So they were offered, in short, humiliation. So they're given a choice between flight and the continuation of their own uh, uh, manner of living or humiliation and they choose flight and uh, and yet and yet so uh, uh, that is his account of that he doesn't so much discuss the the Indian wars in which massacres uh, take place and after all it's not so much what destroys the Indians is not so much military action as this economic uh, development which leaves no place for the Indians and he's very touching, as long as you've asked this question, let me speak for a moment about uh, the blacks, uh, because he has a fantastic chapter called The Three Races in America, meaning the, the whites, the Indians, and the blacks. And he explains that the Indians are welcome to join white society, uh, but prefer not to. The blacks are demanding to join white society and are forbidden to. So it's a complete, uh, it, it's a complete contradiction. And, and his sympathy for the blacks is, is, is again, uh, uh, total, though he understands that, that, that the whole structure of society is also devastating to them, too, because the structure of society, in their case, is designed to, to give them a bad opinion of themselves. So the blacks must struggle against the opinion that everybody has of them, which is that they are inferior, which then they, they incorporate into themselves and must struggle against it, must engage in this cultural struggle. He, Tocqueville, does not think that blacks are inferior. He, he has no doubt that everybody is, is, is equal. But he understands that the cultural message is being delivered to the blacks who want to get into society or refuse to think poorly of themselves and, and are just in a, in a devastating uh, situation. So he cannot imagine a solution to either of these problems uh, of uh, the Indians and their place in American life or the blacks in, and their place in, in American life. And it's part of what leads him to his, the, the, the gloom that finally uh, makes him think about Russians. Okay, thank you. I can't speak to the Ukrainian situation, but, but I, I, I can comment on what Tocqueville thinks. And, and uh, Tocqueville does admire the, the American Constitution, but he's very clear that, that a piece of paper by itself does not suffice. So he comments at one point that in Mexico, the Mexicans have adopted, uh, have, have, have imitated the American Constitution, so have drawn up their own Constitution. But it's just, it's just paper, because they're not, they, don't, they, ha they have the, the, the letter of the Constitution, but they don't have the spirit of, of the Constitution. 
for him, the spirit uh, is, is generalized uh, a, a, among the population as a whole through the mechanisms I've just described. That is, uh, uh, the, the ordinary person learns the qualities of citizenship by participating in town meetings and voluntary associations and, and uh, this kind of thing, by being an activist. Uh, and at the same time, uh, Tocqueville has a great admiration for uh, lawyers and lawyers as a class. Uh, he wonders a lot, is it really possible to have a society without an aristocracy? And, and, and he, he, he ventures the thought that in uh, the American democracy that he sees, there is a sort of aristocracy which consists of lawyers. And, and the lawyers, that is, the lawyers have the, have the role of, of uh, presiding in a, in a presumably disinterested way over a system of, of objective rule. Uh, objective rules. So the cult of law, the respect of law, seems to him crucial. It's the, so it's a combination of the knowledge of citizenship that is drawn up by, that is uh, conjured by participation in local uh, governmental bodies and in voluntary associations, combined with a respect for law, combined with a, a class of lawyers who themselves respect law. And it's, so it's this whole system of people, not just the paper. To, I would think that Tocqueville would think that if you were going to rely just on getting a good document, you might well end up in what he describes as the Mexican situation, in which you have no progress at all in, in Mexico of 1830. They have a, a constitution that seems excellent, but they don't have the spirit of it. The crucial thing is to have the spirit of it diffused among the people. Uh, I really did the same question, uh, which is uh, what makes for a, a successful revolution instead of a failed one, uh, according to Tocqueville. So um, I, I think uh, he was transformed by, 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 by his trip uh, to the United States because after all, uh, uh, no one in Europe had ever seen a successful democracy. It was, a, it was an idea. It was a, a utopian project. There were many mad notions of how to go about it. The one substantial effort to, to build something like that was the French Revolution of 1789, uh, which ended up a catastrophe. Uh, so, all that anyone knew for a fact uh, from having seen with their own eyes was, was that the project was uh, undoable, uh, and yet people wanted to uh, do it. So uh, Tocqueville was transformed by, by his recognition uh, that uh, in the United States it had been thus far until 1831 a success and, and, and a a, an admirable society had, had, had arisen. Uh, what he, he certainly didn't love the idea of revolutions. One of the things that he admired about the United States was that having constructed a, a democratic republic uh, uh, with liberty, it had henceforth been able to avoid revolutions. And uh, one, of the th one of the aspects of a democratic republic uh, that recommended itself to him and that he was recommending to his readers and I think to his family was that if you have such a society, democratic, uh, uh, with, with, with rule of law, you don't have revolutions anymore. Now, if you're the Tocqueville family, uh, uh, who's, uh, you know, m members of which have been guillotined and imprisoned and so forth, a, a, a society that doesn't have revolutions anymore sounds great. And, and if the way to get such a society is, however, to abandon one's own aristocratic privileges and just enroll as, as citizens uh, like everyone else in a democratic society, maybe it's a good deal. Uh, because you'll be merely citizens like everyone else, but then again, you won't be guillotined. Uh, so uh, he, he did think that. Uh, what should be said to the Ukrainians? Uh, 
uh, you know, it's, it's not for me to say, but, but, uh, but Tocqueville says it. Uh, really, you should, you know, the students here, intellectuals, uh, should read the, uh, his book because his book is written as an advice guide to Europeans who, who, want, who are contemplating making the shift to a democratic society. And, and it, 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 it bears uh, precisely on questions of uh, what to think of a constitution. Is a constitution good enough uh, by itself? Uh, and what exactly uh, should be done about uh, political parties and this kind of thing. And I think uh, what you get in, in Tocqueville is, is a broad horizon of things. And that his answer is that it is no one thing in particular. It's only a demagogue who will stand up and, and give a speech saying, I have the one thing that's going to solve the problems of society which is you know, the perfect constitution, or perhaps my own rule, or, or some, indivi some single uh, individual reform. And he explains here, no, it's the whole panoply of things, all to be infused with the democratic spirit, meaning the, equ the equality of status of everyone, and this crucial quality of participation that leads to a sense of uh, social and civic responsibility. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much.